Good morning. Good morning, good morning. It's so good to be back and see all of you. It's been a while. I'm not pregnant anymore. We can celebrate. <laughs> My mental state has returned. It's much better. Um, thank you all for your sweet prayers and for those of you who sent money to uh, the freezer meals and food donations. That was greatly appreciated. It's gotten us through some of the first few weeks. Um, Payson's in the back. I'll be out there later. So if you want to come say hi, feel free. Um, I just have a few announcements this morning. Um, just a reminder that Shannon's 10th year anniversary celebration is coming up. It is in three short weeks. The donations are starting to pour in, thankfully, for the silent auction. If you have a business or um, you know someone who has a business or if you have something of your own that you would like to donate, um, please feel free to reach out to me after the service or send an email to us. We'd be glad to pick that up and coordinate that for you. I know someone is sending a bunch of Mary Kay products. They're bringing a Mary Kay basket. We've had some therapy session donations, which is great. Um, I might take those for myself. And then uh, we have um, some businesses who donate Airbnb stays, things like that. So if you know anyone um, who has any connection or who'd like to donate to Shannon's fundraiser and set an auction, that'd be awesome. If you still want to purchase a table, there is a table for 10 available. You can purchase one of those for $500. You can send uh, sign up with me. I will take your credit card number, however you want to do that. We have a few ladies in here who are going to do that together, which is really great. Uh, you can also buy general admission tickets on our website as well. We will sell out probably in the next two weeks. So if you want to get a ticket, please make sure that you're purchasing those either through me after Bible study or on our website. I can also give you a call later. So if you want to leave me your information, we can set that up as well. Um, it's going to be a great time. Shannon's going to just talk to talk to you a little bit about where she's going. She's also going to have a couple of a high schooler and then a girl that she's mentored for a long time speak as well. So you'll get to hear their testimonies and um, how Mary Shannon Ministries has um, impacted their life as well. We only have about a month left of Bible study, which is crazy. I can't believe um, summer is coming already. Let's hope it doesn't get too hot too soon. Um, but I'll give you more information on an actual end date in a couple of weeks as we inch closer. But it's good to see you. Um, if you are not caught up, please make sure to check out her podcast or her YouTube online. And as always, the best way, the free way you can support Shannon is just by sharing um, on social media. So if you um, are on social media, please share her page. Please share her posts, her podcast, and her YouTube channel. Um, it benefits people all across the country, too. Good to see you. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Good. How was your Easter? Was it good? You realize that's what it's all about. I could hardly put it in words when I prayed at lunch because all I kept thinking was, I mean, everything we believe is about that. It all hinges on that. All the promises of scripture, everything fulfilled in that, all of our hope for the future, all of the redemption, all of the reunion, for me, that's everything. I mean, it all hinges on the fact that Jesus came up out of that grave, that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is holy. His name is greater than any power or position or dominion. He is holy. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And our emotion and what we go through, none, it doesn't change any of that. It's solid. What, oh, what a great celebration. So do you remember, though, where we've been in Acts? Because you know I know how y'all are. Have you, have you had your face in the book? I believe we are in Acts, basically Acts 9, verse 32. Is that correct? Lord, I thank you for this day. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be powerful in this room, um, that you would be the great counselor and the great teacher, and that, Lord, you would speak through me exactly what is your desire to communicate today, and that it would go deep in the hearts of these women. Um, it would go from head to heart to hands and feet, and that we would be your hands and feet to the world. Um, that we would go out and be true citizens of a heavenly kingdom, that we would be lovers and restorers and redeemers, that we would breathe life into those around us. And so, God, I pray that you would be with us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived in Lydda. 
And there he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. I would go by Tabitha. I don't know about you. <laughs> she was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord, and stayed. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon the Tanner. Wow. I think we ended a couple of weeks ago with just the phrase, now as Peter went here and there among them, and I... Uh, I talked about the fact that he was on the move. And if you remember what has happened prior, we had the conversion of Saul to Paul, do you recall? And he comes to Jerusalem, and because of his presence, what happens with persecution again? Do you remember? It's, it's boiling over again. Why? See, where are, your, where are your faces in the book? Really? Uh, uh, why had it boiled over? Because he had now gone out preaching that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ, amongst the Hellenists. Right? Why should that ring a bell to you? Okay, these, these were his people before. It was because of the issue with the Hellenists that eventually Stephen was stoned. Do you remember this? And who did they lay their garments at his feet? Saul. And then, watching Stephen die, enraged Saul all the more. And so remember, he crossed the political aisle, and he got the papers that he needed to go chase all the believers down. And so he is on the road to Damascus with every intention to arrest them and bring them back. And what happens? He meets the risen Lord. And from that moment on, we talked about how Saul had to repivot everything, which was a lot that he knew, in relation to the fact that the truth is Jesus was and is the Christ. He's the king. He is seated on the throne. And so we watched that happen. He went away to Arabia, to the place that I suggested the original giving of the law to reorient it. And then he comes back to Jerusalem. And who helps him? Who helps him come into the body uh, with the apostles? Barnabas, the son of encouragement. And remember, he meets with Peter for 15 days and James, the brother of Jesus. And then he goes out in his area, which were the Hellenists and more than likely the synagogue of the freedmen where all the ruckus had begun with Stephen. And now guess what? He's absolutely on Stephen's team. And they're amazed. And if you think arguing with Stephen is one thing, wait till you get a load of all the knowledge. Now that is pivoted around the truth that Jesus is the Christ. They're enraged. And so they hear that the plan is to kill who now? Saul. And so now we get this idea that over the last three years, we have a network that's growing of people who are actually believers uh, scattered throughout all this. So word is getting out. You got to get this dude out of here. It's like an underground railroad road situation. And so they get him out. They take him where? Caesarea by the sea, Caesarea Maritime, and then they ship him off to Tarsus, where he's from. And then it says... There's a little bit of what? Peace. 
as the church grows. And it is in this time that you see Peter now going in and out, traveling. He is on the move and he is doing what Jesus said that you will strengthen the church. And so there were already groups all along this area, uh, the saints, God's people. Why? Who had been before him? Do you remember? Philip. Philip. Remember the one who went? We had that whole Simon the Magician. We had the Samaritan uh, Pentecost that I, I, we talked about. And then he went along. We had the Ethiopian eunuch. And then he went all along the area of the sea proclaiming that Jesus is the Christ. And so now you have all of these pockets of believers, these churches, these these bodies of believers that are in all of these places. And now Peter, the apostle, is going out visiting amongst them, strengthening them. And so he's building up the church. He did not allow himself to get sedentary in Jerusalem in this time of peace. He's moving. And so a couple weeks ago, I asked you, are you moving? Are you on the move? I think I said our body needs to move. Our brain needs to learn. Our spirit needs to grow. Why? We were created for a purpose. We need to be about the Father's business. And it is much easier to maneuver a moving object than one that is sedentary. We talked about the bicycle. Have you ever ridden a bicycle? If you're gonna take a turn, is it better to have some speed? Yes, you can maneuver that. It's much harder if you're sedentary. Here's the thing. We are called to bring life and healing and order. That's what we do as image bearers of God. That's what we were to do, to bring the kingdom of heaven to the earth, to display that. And so we breathe life. We bring order from chaos, healing. That's what we do. What does the enemy do? He, yeah, he wants to draw us into chaos. And to be quite honest, his goal was that God made everything from nothing is to take what God has created and bring it back to Nothing. Let me ask you something. Relate that to your life. Is it a distraction? Are you getting sedentary? Are you on the move? Are you about your purpose? Or is he bringing you back to nothing? Peter is out and he is encouraging the body of believers. Um... Do you realize that before the coming of Jesus, there were no hospitals? Families took care of the sick. There were no orphanages. In this time, I'm going to be honest with you, nobody cared about children who didn't have parents. They didn't. In that Roman Empire and, and in that culture, they did not care. And most of them wouldn't survive. And if they did, you don't want to know how. It was not a good life. There were no uh, what they call leprosariums, meaning for lepers. Right? When they saw a leper, what'd they do? They ran. There was, uh, there was no disaster relief, <laughs> I wrote down. The only time you see any kind of disaster relief is later on when you see other believers send money to Jerusalem for those whose homes have been taken. It's it's a Christian thing. None of this was a part of society. One commentator, oh, and by the way, there were no schools for common education. Common education. None of that existed to educate the common person. One commentator says this, it is Christians who have gone into cities of the world and have hunted out the poor, the young, the sick, the uneducated, and have brought them into schools to train them and give them skills that enable them to be something other than destiny would seem to have chosen for them. It is Christians who brought that, who breathed life, who brought order from chaos It is Christians who do that. And I've said over and over, right? 
that what we have done is we have given the job of the church to the government because we didn't do our job. And now we want to gripe at how the government is do. It was never their job to do. It was our job to do it. And so we need to get back to what it is to be a follower of Jesus and to display the kingdom of heaven on the earth. If it is hungry, we feed it. If it's sick, we heal it. If it's dead, we breathe life into it. And this is what we're going to see that Peter is out doing. What is he doing? Exactly what Jesus did. He is following in the footsteps of Jesus. It's as if for a little while we've been focused on Saul or Paul. And when we focus on Paul, what do we, what is our sight line usually? When I think about Paul, my sight line or my vision goes way far because I know the expanse that Paul is going to take the gospel. Like you, I can just look out on the horizon. We shipped him off to Tarsus and man, Paul's ministry is going to expand. But I think I said a couple weeks ago, it's like when you're sitting there daydreaming on your back patio and all of a sudden a hummingbird shows up. What happens? It brings you back to the present right then. And that is what's happening now. We're coming, Saul has been, he's off for a while. Oh, it's coming. But right now we need to refocus on what? Right now, what's happening right here with Peter? So here we go to the present once again. It's as if our mind goes far and comes present. So he goes to Lydda, which is ancient Lod. And if you've ever been to Israel, you've been to Lydda. You're like, what? I don't remember that. If you landed at Ben Gurion Airport, you were in Lydda. All right, that's where it is, ancient Lod. And so he goes there and he is gonna meet Aeneas. And then eventually after that, he's gonna go to Joppa, which is Joppa, and it's in the area, all of that's in the area of Tel Aviv. Okay, if it, just to bring it current. And he's gonna meet a woman by the name of Tabitha. That's her um, Aramaic name and her Greek name is Dorcas. I would have definitely gone with the Aramaic And uh, it means gazelle. Can you picture her? I can. I picture her as tall and graceful and swift. She gets a lot done. I don't know if I'm tall and graceful, but I can get a lot done. I can tell you that, right? Um, And so I want to take this, those two stories together, and I want to look at them in different angles because I want you to just see how I see it. So Aeneas, let's talk about him. It says that Peter found a man. Isn't that interesting? He found him. Well, how? I don't know. Did he go into, did someone invite him into this home? Had they taken him out of the home and put him like they normally did, carrying those who are lame? We don't know, but what we know is that Peter found him. And when it came to Tabitha, how is it different? We're going to kind of look at the differences. In that story, they came and found Peter, okay? So in one, Peter finds this person because no one seems to be operating on his behalf. And on the other story, you have two men that are coming to find him because this Tabitha, she was important. They loved her. She was the gazelle, okay? And so... For Aeneas, he was bedridden for eight years. Some, some people say from eight years old on. But we know that for eight years, he was bedridden. So think about this. That's no life. I mean, basically, it's laying in your deathbed. You have one who has no ability to be productive at all. And the other who's viewed as, what does her name mean? a gazelle. I mean, she just is bounding through life, uh, doing all kinds of things. With Aeneas, we have no background for him. Do you notice that? None. We have no idea if he really, I mean, we have no facts. 
believe or not, Jew, Gentile, we can assume basically in the story, he's probably a part of the saints, but basically the point is he's very obscure, right? He's very obscure. He really seems to have no value really in this story. He is just a human being. We have no background for him. He is a human being in a very desperate, terrible place. Possibly alone and forgotten. On the flip side, with her, she is a woman disciple. Tell you what, she gets a lot done. It says that she's a, what, what would a disciple be, by the way? What does it mean to us? Well, there were a couple things when we looked at the early church. What were the two descriptions of the early church? Those who followed Jesus, disciples. They dedicated themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to koinonia. What does that mean? Sharing. That's the easiest uh, definition. Sharing in Jesus Christ, one body. And by that, from sharing in Jesus, we what? We share. We share ourselves, we share our energy, we share our time, our lives, and our stuff. We're generous. And so we see all of that displayed in this woman disciple. And do I need to even go into the woman? Woman disciple. Okay? She was a huge part of the church. They were huge parts of the church. There were women disciples, women prophets. They were a big part of the early church, full of good works, it says, and acts of charity. Now, does your Bible, some of your Bibles say kindness? Okay, well, that's part of it. That's part of that definition of charity is the word kindness, which makes me think of 1 Corinthians 13, 4. What does that say? Well, let's look at it. Love is patient and kind. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. So this is a description of what love is. Or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. And when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, with all of that knowledge, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is what? Is love. She had the greatest. Love. She was full, she was full of charity and kindness that endures forever. Right now, everything else is partial and it will be fulfilled when we see Jesus face to face. But love, that, it exists forever. And she was a picture of that to her community. And so because of that, guess what happened when she died? They mourned. This was a huge loss. Not only did they mourn, they got dressed up in all of the things, what? She made for them, displaying her kindness. It's like filling up the entire thing of CCV in a celebration of life and handing the microphone around to all of the ways that person touched your life. I mean, this is a deal. There is great mourning and so much that they send two men to come because they hear Peter is close and there is hope. They've prepared her body, but they laid her in the upper room. 
Now these two together, do they remind you of any other two stories that are, we read in the gospels that are together like that? How about the hemorrhaging woman and, and Jairus' daughter? Okay, does that remind you? Okay, remember that Peter is emulating, he is continuing the work of Jesus. And Luke is writing Acts, why? To explain to Theophilus, Christianity, the church, Paul's conversion, what this is all about, and the expansion of the gospel. There's a point here. And so he's showing these two extremes to cover this scenario. So once again, like with the hemorrhaging woman, we know what? She had no one. She was worthless. She'd been basically dying for 12 years, right? Everything she touched was impure. And so she was alone. And she thought, if I can just stay under the radar and invisible and just touch his garment, I will be healed because she had great faith. And on the other side, you have Jairus, who is the religious leader, and his daughter's been living for 12 years, and then she dies. So you have this juxtaposition, right, of what is going on. And so here you have Peter literally walking in the steps of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus continuing. He says to Aeneas, pick up your pallet and walk. Well, where did he hear that? Make, you could quote this to your kids. Get up, make your bed. You hear, that's a really good thing to do every day. But bottom line, what does that mean? And especially when Jesus, by the way, Jesus said that in Mark 2, 11, okay? He's saying that is what? It's done. You have a new life. Make that bed and let's go. Why? Because now he is going, he's important. He's going to be a walking testimony to the Lord. So you make that bed, you're not getting back in it. Don't go. Pick up your pallet. We got places to be, right? We got to go. And for her, then he goes into the upper room. And do you see the similarities with Jesus healing Jairus' daughters? What are the similarities? He told them to leave, okay? And he is alone. And not only that, he says, Tabitha, arise, which is Tabitha Kumi. What did Jesus say to the little girl? Talitha Kumi. I mean, it's like one syllable off, you guys. Little girl, arise. But here's the thing. What does Peter do first? He prays. He sends them out and he prays and then there's a healing. There is prayer and then the what? Power. Because the healing is not coming from Peter. It is coming from Jesus through Peter. And so you have uh, this great healing. And now she arises and you want to talk about two walking testimonies in two different areas. Like this is the continuation. We've said before, this is what is important. Each life is important. Why? Because we have points of contact. We have things that God has set in place for us to do. People to see, to meet, to cross over, to impact their lives, who then they do what? They have their points of contact. uh, Peter traveled 10 miles to go to Tabitha. Gosh, can you imagine that? What do you think was running through his mind? Was he thinking about how much... Lazarus? Was he thinking about Jairus' daughter in that situation about what Jesus did? I wonder if we stop for 10 minutes to think about anything. James 127 came to my mind here. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I'm going to tell you what. Religion has become about a list of behaviors more than 
the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It is about leaning in to Jesus and being with him so much that we become like him, which means that the love that he had for the world is displayed to them. That we go make an impact on this world because we have spent enough time in the other world. It's a huge conviction to me. Most, I think half my young life, I worried about all kinds of my own personal behavior so much that I really didn't even pay attention to the world around me because I needed to have the image of a Christian instead of the lifestyle of one, which is visiting the widow and loving the poor and displaying that to the world. It's not about image. He is continuing the work of Jesus. All right, here we go. This is a good next part, chapter 10 which I'm going to get to the fact that he is staying in Joppa for many days with Simon the Tanner. That's a big deal, so don't forget that. Chapter 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. A devout man who feared God with all of his household, gave alms generously to the people, and, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Mm, Cornelius. Okay. He lived in Caesarea by the sea. Uh, when we go back to Israel, because we will, that is one of the first places we go is if, if depending on when we land, uh, we keep you up all day long so that you can sleep the next night. But we go to Caesarea Maritime. It is unbelievable. It is a seaport at the Mediterranean Sea. It was built by Herod the Great. He named it after Caesar Augustus. It was the Roman administration in Palestine. It is unbelievable. It is the showpiece of Roman culture. So much of it is still there. You can sit in the Hippodrome. You can see the amphitheater where all, all the chariot races were. And you can see this unbelievable uh, seaport because uh, Herod built that so that all the shipping could come into this area. Let me tell you what, he was something. And not only did he build that, and he built it out of volcanic ash, uh, creating this concrete structure. Uh, he, there was a temple to Caesar. Um, what else do you need to know? Uh, the aqueduct that he built, bringing fresh water all the way from the bottom of Mount Carmel, all the way down into Caesarea. <laughs> there are toilets. I have a picture sitting on one. I should have brought it. Uh, I mean, it's, it was unbelievable, but it was predominantly Gentile. Okay, uh, not Jew. Um, according to Josephus, it is where the riots started that spurred on the war of AD 66, the war of the Jews against Rome, which ended in what? In AD 70, what happened? The destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And so it was here that everything sparked. And it was that very year that Josephus says the entire Jewish population in Caesarea Maritime was murdered. Like 22,000 Jews were murdered in this area. So this is like the hub of the Roman culture, can I just say. And this is where he lived. And he was a centurion. Um, and he was with a unique cohort. Okay, but, and, and there's all kinds of stuff you can study about this. Like I could go down these, I can get distracted with the point going down all this history stuff. But at the very least, how many did he command? 
a hundred at the least, probably more, but he was that leader. And in order to be a centurion, you had to have impeccable character. You had to be a man who uh, thought, who led, who didn't pull the sword too quickly to get the uh, armies into a pickle. I mean, you were the man. He had power and he had leadership skills. But what is so interesting to me is it seems uh, that these Roman centurions, don't they always seem to have a positive light in the Gospels? Right? Which, it's, it's interesting to me. I mean, I'll give you Matthew 8. Look at that one. Actually, I think I'm going to read you that one. Matthew 8, 5 through 13. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, talking about Jesus, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Well, he, he knew about authority. And he knew where he was in that authority. And then it says, I tell you, and here's the thing that I think ran through the disciples like Peter's mind. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. What kind of faith? He understood authority <clears throat> and he understood where he was in that authority, in that line. And I believe that in Peter's mind, he kept hearing that. Oh, those that will come from north and south and east and west to recline <clears throat> at the table of Abraham when the sons of the kingdom will be standing outside. Does that remind you of any other parable? <clears throat> How about the parable of the prodigal? The fact that the oldest firstborn, where did he end up standing at the end of the parable? He's outside the party. We don't ever, we don't know. We're left not knowing if he ever came in to the celebration, to home, to peace, to uh, this great feast that was happening. And what do we know about Israel? Israel is considered God's firstborn. All nations are his. But they were used for a purpose. And so you have this idea here that something new is beginning to open up and it's starting here with the centurion because there are going to now be those coming from the north and south and east and west that will be invited in to sit down at the table of who? Abraham. Through Abraham, all nations will be blessed. It was also in Matthew 27, 54, when Jesus died on the cross and there was the great earthquake, who was the one that said, aha, truly this was the son of God. Who was it? A centurion. Why? Because that person understands power and authority and they recognize it. And so you have them uh, really put in a positive light, which is really interesting considering I believe that Luke is writing this for someone by the name of Theophilus to bring a defense for Paul in this great conversion. So it is nice that these Roman centurions are all viewed in this positive light. It says that he and all of his family were very devout and God-fearing. Wow. Wow. We know that centurions were men of good character, but this is beyond. He was devout and God-fearing. Man, 
Stories like this drive me crazy. Why? I want to know more. I want to know why. Why was he God-fearing and devout? Like what? Did he? Why? Did he meet someone? Like what's going on? I can't wait to get to heaven. I know. Don't even analyze my theology. I want to find out all kinds of stuff, right? And so it's exciting. But here's the thing. I just said, I, I leaned back and I thought, had he just seen enough? I mean, had he seen enough of the Roman excess? Had he seen enough entertainment and competitions and violence and greed and drunkenness and debauchery and temple orgies to all the gods who always seemed angry, who never seemed to impact anything? Had he just had enough? Made me think of people like, and I don't know them personally, I can only judge what I see, people like a Jim Carrey. They just see enough. And at the end of the day, they're just like, I'm empty. Is there any truth here to be found? When your eyes finally open at the end of the time, when someone like King Solomon says, I did not deny myself not one thing ever. I fulfilled every urge a man could ever have. And at the end of it, I was left with what? Emptiness. It reminds me of what Ashley Wooldridge said in our service this last weekend. You cannot fill a spiritual hole with an earthly what? Thing. It's impossible. I don't know his story, but I know that something drew him out of this Roman world seeking something more, and he believed in Yahweh. He was not fully into the Jewish world like a proselyte being circumcised, but he was seeking the face of the one true God. He was a God-fearer, and he was devout. And that just, it amazes me. And how do we know that was for real? <clears throat> that he was truly a god fear? Well, look at what it says about him. It says that he was generous. That he, <clears throat> he was generous in the giving of alms. Who did he take care of? The poor. The down and out. And he was a man of prayer. Like continuous prayer, more than likely praying as the Jew prayed in the three times of day that they prayed. So what do we know about this? He was a man who understood authority, who had authority over him, and he believed that authority was God. And so he bowed the knee to that authority. And when he did, what came out of him? Love God, love people. I have said to you, I don't know how many times when I teach about the kingdom and I always bring Daniel and the idea all through uh, Daniel and through the Bible, when you look at the beasts, the image of the beasts, we are told that when man fails to bow the knee to God, we can become like the beasts. I wonder if Cornelius in his Roman military career had gotten his fill of seeing beasts and thought there has to be something more. And so he bowed the knee to the one true God. And when he did, a man who had power did not abuse power. He used power to what? Take care of the poor, to do good. A soldier bowing before God. His power was in the proper perspective. He was a soldier with heart. Micah 6, 8 says this. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice. And to love kindness. And to walk humbly before your God. I don't know about you. Seems to describe a man by the name of Cornelius. 
beautiful picture. I wonder where he first saw this kind of lifestyle. How about from the Jewish people? And I didn't necessarily say the Jewish leaders. This is predominantly a Roman world, and Jewish families are living in it. But they're very different than the Romans. They seem to really dedicate themselves to a true God. They tell stories of a God who's involved, who's not angry, but is abounding in love. Their whole world rotates around this God. What they eat, how they pray. Wasn't that the point? Weren't they to be a light to the nations? Weren't these ways of life, they weren't to be prisons, but to show the world a difference of life? Sabbath being one of them, you know that basically God gives us the Sabbath for three R's. Rest, remembrance, and relationship. If you go back through the Bible, those are the, basically why he gave them the Sabbath. Rest, stop what you're doing. I'm going to give you the garden back for a day. Rest. While you're resting, remember what I have done for you. I am the God that freed you from Egypt. Remember all that I have done for you and let it be a sign to you and to the nations. And that sign literally means like engagement ring. It is showing the world that he is our priority. He is first. We are displaying that. So somehow he was introduced to the God of the Jews and he is right there seeking and honestly displaying that lifestyle very well. He was being drawn to something. And it says that he was praying at one of the Jewish times to pray. Three o'clock in the afternoon. And when he did, God came to him in a vision through a messenger. And what was his response? Well, what would your response be? Terror. Right? Terror. He knew exactly this was someone from another realm, a spiritual realm that was greater than him. What is it, Lord? What is it, Adonai? And the answer, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Do you understand that sacrificial language? What does that say? His prayers had what? Ascended? What does that remind you of in the Old Testament? The altar of incense. Okay, do do you remember this? Okay, you remember about the tabernacle? You come in the gate of the tabernacle. When you come in, you just bump right in to the brazen altar. Without the forgiveness of sins, right? Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. You got to handle the cross. You ca- Listen, how people are always saying God accepts you as you are. He loves you as you are, okay? But I'm going to be clear. He invites you as you are. How about that? Okay, because he's inviting you into relationship as you are, but you won't be the same after the meeting. Do you understand that? Because you're being birthed into a new life. You have become alive, which means that if you're alive, you produce what? Fruit, right? So I'm not sure except you. I don't like to use that term. He loves you as you are, and he invites you as you are, but he will not leave you as you are. This is a journey with him, and we see change in fruit. It's not our job, by the way, though, that when he invites them, then we burden them down with everything we think they should look like. How about we let the fruit happen? I'm growing a garden right now. The most exciting thing I It's when something comes up. I'm shocked. I don't know what I'm doing. I forgot I planted asparagus. And that little thing popped its head. You would have thought. I was like, oh, oh my God. I ran and I go, I have an asparagus. And Rob comes out and now I have four. Let me 
tell you, if our garden, if we had to rely on our garden to live, we would starve to death, okay? But it was so exciting because it's growth. How about we get excited when people grow and we quit expecting them to be what we want them to be? God will do his job. The Holy Spirit will grow them, right? And so that is what is happening. It starts with the transformation, death to life. And then what? Then you walk in and it is the labor. It's a daily washing of the word. Okay? And then you walk in the tabernacle, in the proper, the tent. And on the right, it is the table of showbread, which means we sit down and eat. We fellowship. We hang out. We eat his flesh and drink his... We... we, We become one with him. We lean into that relationship. And then what? The light of the world. The lampstand. That when we do that, we shine with the light of Jesus. Why? Because you can tell I've been hanging with him. Because then I start to look like him. And then when I do that, guess what? The very thing before the presence of God is the altar of incense, the prayers of the saints, all coming up as a pleasing aroma before God. This is a Gentile Roman centurion. And the language that was just said to them is I'm, just, I'm seeing this. I died for you too. Your prayers are a pleasing aroma And you're giving an alms. Like, this is the real deal. And it says this. Now, send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. Wow. I would have, my last thought, I've got a lot more. Uh... (laughs) I would love to know what the centurion's prayers were. Because when I thought about the whole sacrifice, the the altar of incense, okay, and prayers, my mind immediately went to Zechariah. Zechariah, for once in his life, in the Old Testament, if you remember, there's 400 years of silence. And then, bam, God speaks. Because Zechariah goes, once in a lifetime deal, and he is getting to tend the altar of incense. And he's praying. And if you remember, Zechariah and Elizabeth were barren. He's praying, but it's also his job to be praying for the coming of who? The Messiah. Oh, Lord, come. Come and restore Israel. O king, come. He has both things going on. He's got a personal prayer inside of him. And then he has a responsibility that he is praying for Israel. And guess what? God shows up and he answers both. He says, oh yeah, he's coming. And guess what? You're going to have a son and he's going to be the one who is going to prepare the way. And you see God answer the personal and the corporate all at one time. And it's so interesting to me because you have these, this distance between Peter who's going to be up praying. Okay, and you can imagine and we'll speculate about that next week. And you have Cornelius who is praying. What is he praying? I don't know. But it gives us a hint later when he tells the story about how it says, send Peter and he will tell you what it is, what I've done, what it is to be saved. And so he's seeking God and you watch God work together to answer the personal, but also for the corporate plan that he has because I'm telling you Peter who's been given the keys to the kingdom is about to use it to open up a whole nother door and it starts with the man who is on the fringes a Gentile seeking a relationship with God and we're going to see them end up at a place you think Joppa had good trade Caesarea 
was the gateway, the shipping of the world, and it's where it's all going to start and take place. I mean, it is amazing. We're a part of something amazing. We pray in a personal way. And then God answers the personal. He's with us in the personal, but we're a part of his plan. We see over and over again, God is in your story. Absolutely, he's in your story. He's personal. He wants to use you in a personal way. You are a part of his story. I heard Jordan Peterson say yesterday, I was having a day. And I, once again, I'm reminded that if you... If you know your why, if your why is big enough, you'll get the answer to the how. How am I going to get through this day? How am I going to get through this life? My why has to be big enough. And the only way my why is going to be big enough is if I sit often with the Lord. That's it. We got to get about the Father's business. I believe we're at a place where the general population is had enough. Enough of the entertainment, enough of the illogic, enough of the debauchery, enough of enough. And they don't know what they're searching for, but they're searching for something. And we need to be about the Father's business. We need to be about seeking the Lord in prayer and the giving of alms to be that healing salve to our world. It's not about us. It's about him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for today. I thank you for the reminder always, God, that we need to fix our eyes on you. When I look at Peter, he's emulating. That's what he's doing. He's doing exactly what you promised in the upper room. You think our relationship's coming to end? Pfft, that's crazy. It's just getting started. You ain't seen nothing yet. Because you're going to see all the Jesuses going out into the world. And if it's hungry, feed it. And if it's sick, heal it. If it's dead, breathe life into it. Bringing order, beautiful order, into chaos. And it looks like love and hope, kindness, charity. That's what it is about. Introducing people to Jesus and then watching it take root and producing fruit. Lord, I pray that you would draw us into deep, deep relationship with you. And so our life would be a pleasing aroma to you. We are a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. God, please show us the points of contact. Lord, sometimes we need to see the miracle to stay in the game. We just need a little bit. Make us see it because it's there. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you would have for us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.